organize the 222 FIFA World Cup is Qatar. <laughs> A lot has been said about the small state hosting the World Cup, the first Arab country to do so. But I feel like the most important aspects have been largely neglected by much of the press and on social media. While most know by now how Qatar bought the World Cup, the corruption of FIFA and the horrible conditions of migrant workers, there's been little talk about the actual class system of Qatar and the complicity of the so-called democracies in the brutal exploitation of migrant labor, their relation to the power of Qatar's ruling class, and the world capitalist system that facilitates such a situation in the first place. Many point out the hypocrisy of Global North commentators about how there's outrage when Qatar hosts the World Cup, but when France or the US does it, those same people don't say anything. And while that is true of course, we still need to look at the oppressive Qatari system and say something about it. Other voices stress that critique of Qatar mostly boils down to Islamophobia and a disrespect for other cultures. It's time for a materialist analysis to annul both the hypocrisy of the West and the moral relativism and idealism that shields the Qatari state from criticism. Now football, yes, sorry Americans, I'm not calling it soccer, is the most popular sports in the world and hence a massive billion dollar business and a powerful PR vehicle. As with any other sphere of life, be it nature, art, sports in general, capital and the according imperial ambitions exploit it for its interests. This is nothing new and did not start with Qatar or the well-known FIFA corruption. It is a sports beloved by the peoples of the world, a universal language, bringing human beings together, regardless of age or nationality not least because of its beautiful simplicity and the ability of even the poorest to enjoy it. But as the World Cup is happening, it is important to learn about the class hierarchy of Qatar and its place within the imperialist system. Qatar, located in Western Asia, on the Qatar Peninsula, shares its only land border with Saudi Arabia, with the rest of the territory being surrounded by the Persian Gulf. It takes only two hours to drive from top to bottom. Qatar is tiny, but its wealth is gigantic. It is the fourth richest country on earth in terms of per capita income and held the number one position for several years not too long ago. This is of course mainly due to the fact that it shares the world's largest gas field with Iran, thus being among the world's largest exporters of liquefied natural gas, making it practically the largest emitter of CO2 per capita in the world. Qatar's population has roughly doubled every decade, reaching about 2.8 million with over 90% of the population being migrant workers so Qatari nationals are only a minority in the country. Its capital is Doha, which is home to over 80% of the population. Today, Qatar is one of the most powerful states in the region, with seemingly limitless ambition and wealth. Ferraris and Lamborghinis racing through the streets, skyscrapers shooting out of the ground within a few months with an over 2 million large army of migrant labor, brutally exploited in the shadows of the glamour. Just 75 years ago, the Gulf country was poor and reliant on pearl diving. Already in the 8th century, during the Umayyad period, the region became a center of pearl trading. It was not until the 1820s when the House of Thani was created, the dynasty which rules Qatar ever since, and is today, with an estimated net worth of $335 billion, the third richest royal family in the world, just behind the family that rules Kuwait and the House of Saud. The Al Thanis had settled in Qatar 100 years before that from present-day Saudi Arabia. 
In 1871, the House of Thani submitted to the rule of the Ottoman Empire. It was not until World War I when the Ottomans renounced their claim on Qatar. But the Qataris didn't gain independence. Soon afterward, in 1916, it became a British protectorate. Qatar was granted military protection from both external and internal threats by the British, who in turn got an oil concession for the British oil company. The Anglo-Persian Oil Company, a precursor to the British Petroleum Company, who today as BP PLC is one of the global oil giants. Massive oil reserves were discovered in 1939, but their exploitation and development were delayed by the Second World War. Oil soon became the country's main source of revenue. By 1971, those treaty arrangements with the government of the United Kingdom were terminated, and Qatar became an independent state. Qatar had entered, together with Bahrain and seven other so-called trucial states, talks to create a federation. But some regional disputes led Bahrain and Qatar to remain independent, and the others went on to become the United Arab Emirates. Qatar continued being a relatively weak regional power and practically a vassal state of Saudi Arabia, who exerted its regional power through the Gulf Cooperation Council with headquarters in Riyadh, the capital of the kingdom. However, through high-profile proactive diplomacy and advertising campaigns, the instability and falling power of other regional powers such as Iraq, and most importantly, through the exploding financial power due to oil and gas, Qatar would outcompete its rivals and is now one of the dominant players in the region. Through the globally expanding Al Jazeera media network, created in 1996, it could boost its aggressive global branding campaign aimed at attracting foreign investors, portraying it as a global player, dynamic and progressive. The current World Cup and various other sport events are part of this ongoing effort. Qatar has been active in mediation and diplomatic activities, such as in Lebanon in 2008, Sudan in 2011, or through facilitating peace talks between the Taliban and the US State Department. It was by and large the only place among Arab countries which avoided any political unrest during the Arab Spring, which began in December 2010. It's one of the few Gulf states which could maintain remarkable political stability. The estimated 10 to 20% Shia minority is relatively well integrated compared to the other states, which exhibit greater sectarian divisions and tensions. The strengthened position allowed Qatar to become increasingly involved in various wars. In 1991, it supported the Saudi troops in the Gulf War after the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. In 2011, Qatar joined the NATO operations in Libya and has funded various armed groups such as in Syria. Qatar supports the Muslim Brotherhood and was also a participant in the Saudi Arabian-led bombardment in Yemen. But like other states who gained formal independence in the 20th century, Qatar didn't exactly gain true autonomy, but had to submit itself and find its place within the new imperialist system. The most important political factor of Qatar's ability to emerge as a great regional power is that it could act under the US security umbrella. One could argue that this is what made its rise possible to begin with. The US and the UK have recently signed defense pacts with Qatar, as has France in 1994. Highly skilled Qatari special forces have been trained by Western countries, including France. In 2003, Qatar was one of the main launching sites of the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq and served as the US Central Command headquarters. Qatar hosts the largest US military base in the Middle East, the Al Udaid Air Base, southwest of Doha, with over 11,000 US troops. Operating under US military security allowed Qatar to devote its attention and resources to non security related matters such as investing and developing its petroleum exporting capabilities. And of course, the most crucial underlying reason for the rise of Qatar is economic, the financial power based on oil and gas. More specifically, LNG, 
liquefied natural gas. Qatar shares the largest oil field in the world with Iran. But Iran cannot exploit this as well as Qatar due to international sanctions. Gas is important for the Gulf country, since national oil fields are projected to be largely depleted by 2023. Qatar's proved gas reserves are the third largest in the world, accounting for more than 13% of the global resource. The Qatari ruling class strategically positioning itself as the largest supplier of LNG was a game changer. Supported by massive investments from international oil giants, mostly by ExxonMobil and Shell, the country's rise in financial might has been nothing short of phenomenal. The great advantage of LNG is that it's liquid, so it takes up about one six hundredth of the volume of natural gas in its gas form. Gas was much less important during the 20th century. Unless there was a pipeline nearby, there wasn't really any viable method to get it to consumers or buyers. This meant that natural gas markets were very local, production could only be consumed regionally. However, with the development of technology, such as cryogenic storage, commercializing and transporting natural gas throughout a global market was now possible, without the need of a pipeline being nearby. Natural gas could now be transported in special transport containers by road, rail and water. In 2022, due to the war in Ukraine and other reasons, the importance of LNG increased rapidly. As there is greater independence with regard to the selection of supply countries compared with supply by pipeline. For Qatar, this meant sheer endless wealth and power. It could now use the surplus it gained from the massive LNG business to diversify and exert financial influence. The Qatar Investment Authority QIA, with assets of over $450 billion, is the ninth richest sovereign wealth fund in the world. Qatar Holding, the international investment arm of the wealth fund, has investments around the world, such as Siemens, Credit Suisse, Barclays Bank, Heathrow Airport, Volkswagen Group, Bank of America, Agricultural Bank of China, or Royal Dutch Shell. The West may condemn Qatar's loss during the World Cup, but they surely love Qatar's money. The state of Qatar alone, excluding individual royals' personal holdings, is the 10th largest landowner in the UK, owning more property than the British royal family. Qatar Holding also bought the football club Paris Saint-Germain, which had been in financial difficulties six months after the World Cup had been awarded to Qatar. Just a week before the vote, the then chief of the UEFA, Michel Platini, had met with the then French president Nicolas Sarkozy and the then crown prince, Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani. Platini flipping his vote from the US to Qatar was probably the key moment for Qatar winning the vote to host the World Cup. Even then FIFA president Zepp Blatter said so. In return, Sarkozy wanted the Qataris to buy Sarkozy's favorite football team PSG, and France got a couple of huge deals, such as Qatar buying 50 airplanes from giant French airplane maker Airbus. The Qatari president of PSG, billionaire Nasser Al Khalifi, is also head of Al Jazeera Sports, which launched Be In Sport with Al Khalifi as its chairman. About a year after the Sarkozy meeting, Be In Sports secured the rights to the top French football league for 90 million euros a year. Qatar's accumulated capital has allowed them to host the by far most expensive World Cup in history. It also enabled Qatar to increasingly act somewhat independently on the political stage. Qatar's foreign policy approach is often called hedging, that is, trying to maintain open lines of communication with various competing political actors. It has maintained close relations with diverse allies such as Iran, the United States, China, Turkey and even Israel. But the rapid economic modernization and the according expansion of its capital have created a tension with its backward political structure. This contradiction is expressed both by the need to brand itself to international capital and the necessity to deal with criticism both from within and without while protecting the current class hierarchy.
The football teams competing for the gold trophy are staying in the most luxurious resorts in Qatar. This is England's day. The US team sleeps here. Here's where Germany's team is staying. Or I guess was staying. Here's the hotel of the Belgian team. The most opulent place of Qatar, however, is called Pearl Island, Qatar's most exclusive district and the residence of the who's who of Qatar's upper classes. It's the wealthy expat zone, completely insulated. It has no authenticity and is sort of an European Disneyland, convincing its wealthy Western residents that they're not actually in the Middle East. Qatar is sort of a microcosm of global inequality. On the one hand, the wealthy stratum, segregated away from the global south workforce. In general, Doha is set up in such a way that its wealthy citizens don't get to see or have too much contact with the quote, dirty workers who maintain the whole thing. At the bottom of the class hierarchy are the migrant laborers, predominantly from India, Bangladesh or Pakistan, who make up about 95% of people employed in the private sector. They are primarily employed in construction and the service industry. Much has been said about the so-called kafala system, but one important aspect is rarely mentioned. Kafala means sponsorship in Arabic and is prevalent in Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates as well. It is popular as it keeps a tight grip over the majority working population. Essentially, the kafala system means that the employer is exclusively responsible for the worker, which means in concrete terms that the workers are not allowed to leave their job or even Qatar without permission from their employer. Various groups have described it as a form of indentured servitude or slave labor. The way it works is that agents are sent out to villages in Bangladesh, for instance, where people with little opportunity outside subsistence farming are recruited. They are then given visas, often for a sum of money they don't have. So they have to borrow money against the family's land, for instance, usually over $4,000. A huge sum, considering the income in Bangladesh's poor regions being around $80 a month. After arriving in Qatar, many are paid as little as $200 a month, making it impossible to send any money back home and pay back their debt anytime soon. Migrant workers in Qatar are not allowed to form or join trade unions by law. Many are hoarded into labor camps outside the city, living with 8 to 16 people in a room with miserable sanitary conditions. Workers regularly don't receive their payments, experience widespread abuse, deportations and even cases of torture have been reported. People have to work under unimaginable heat. Female domestic workers experience regular abuse and degrading treatment. Qatar denies the high death numbers that they've been accused of. But their own numbers are vague. The International Labour Organization says they heavily underestimate death counts. They would, for instance, not count deaths from respiratory failure or heart attacks as work-related, even though these are common signs of heat strokes caused by doing heavy labor in extremely high temperature. When FIFA president Gianni Infantino Today I feel uh, gay was asked what he thought about migrant worker conditions in Qatar, he said that, quote, My parents emigrated as well from Italy to Switzerland. Not so far, but still. When you give work to somebody, even in hard conditions, you give him dignity and pride. It's not charity. Under pressure of international media attention and various labor organizations, Qatar announced to reform the sponsorship system in collaboration with the ILO, Though in various reports, organizations have pointed out how these reforms aren't really being implemented very effectively, to no one's surprise. What is rarely mentioned in this discourse is that foreign capital benefits from the horrible labor conditions as well. Western liberal democracies may criticize the horrible conditions of migrant labor while not losing a word about German, French or US companies operating there as well to boost profits benefiting from them. Here is British Lloyds Bank listing the inexpensive labor force as a pro for foreign investors, which they of course exploit en masse. And let's not forget the world capitalist system that makes people go work there in the first place. 
people are free to work in Qatar, just as people from Africa are, quote, free to flee from global warming toward the north. People from Bangladesh or India have often no other choice but to seek employment there due to abject poverty caused by centuries of colonial and imperialist exploitation. The upper stratum of migrant labor is disproportionately white. People with cushy office jobs, not preoccupied with the dirty physical labor. Westerners make up about 5% of the population. Yet, they are very visible in the city's various malls, high-end hotels or golf courses. In Qatar, they are called expats or expatriates, not migrant labor. That label is reserved for low-income Arabs, Africans and Asians. The class hierarchy is highly racialized. The Qataris learned this, of course, from the British Empire. Many of the expats can be counted to the petty bourgeoisie or the upper labor aristocracy, the top 2%, high-income bankers, consultants and high executives managing foreign capital of the domestic and foreign big bourgeoisie. To that big bourgeoisie, the top 1%, belong the various Qatari families who rule the country. And among those families, one stands above all others, the Al Thani family, who rule Qatar both as the wealthiest owners and as the undisputed executives of the state. Qatar is what's called a semi-constitutional monarchy. What does that mean? It means that the supreme executive authority is constituted by a council of ministers, with great power over legislation as well. But the members who constitute the council of ministers, including the prime minister, are appointed by the Amir, the ruler of Qatar, who has exclusive power to do so. Although better than Saudi Arabia in some areas, there's still immense gender inequality. Homosexual acts are illegal and punishable by death. The Consultative Assembly is made up of 45 members, 30 elected and 15 appointed by the Amir. The current Amir, the sole ruler of Qatar, is the aforementioned Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani, or Tamim the Glorious, as his subjects call him. His face is everywhere in Qatar. On June 2013, he was crowned as the fourth Amir of Qatar. At 33 years old, he was the youngest ruler in the Arab world. His older brother was considered crown prince for a while, but the conservative Tamim was chosen because, among his rivals, quote, one played too much, the other prayed too much. He has three wives, 13 children, he's the owner of 4,000 cars, 15 airplanes, and one of the largest yachts in the world. A sports fan from young age, he became member of the International Olympic Committee at 22. He would soon utilize sports as a core tool to advertise Qatar to the world. The Al Thanis are by far the most powerful family in Qatar. There is no other that comes even close to their power. They hold the bulk of ministerial positions and they are by far the biggest owners and decision makers in the economy. They hold close to a third of the board of directors positions in the 44 Qatar exchange listed companies. The ruling class in Qatar is made up of a network of various members of powerful Qatari families, holding leading positions in the state apparatus, which are intertwined with positions in the board of directors of private and state-owned enterprises. Qatar is run like a large family business, family connections, tightly knit personal allegiance, nepotism and the according systemic corruption dominate Qatari business, politics and society functions in general. Much like in Game of Thrones where the different families form alliances based on mutual benefit, there is one family who is core to the power network. The Al Thanis are sort of the Targaryens of Qatar. The Al Thani family connections are so important for power brokers and business people. A PR firm sells the complete Al Thani family tree for $6,000, where you can follow which family members dominate which ministries and businesses. As with the Targaryens of Westeros, the only real competition for the Al Thani members are other members of the family. One example of inner family competition is the Qatari coup of 1995, where Hamad bin Khalifa Al Thani, the father of the current Amir, seized control from his dad, Khalifa bin Hamad Al Thani, while he was on a visit to Geneva in Switzerland, with the support of the military and some other political allies, including France. 
All of this begs the question, how come the Qatari ruling class can maintain this class hierarchy with feudal characteristics and resist the progress of history? One theory poses that since Qatar derives the bulk of its income through the extraction, processing and sale of oil and gas, and not through taxation of income, since Qatar has no income tax, its citizens are less inclined to demand changes from the state. No taxation, no representation, so to speak. This is the theory of the rentier state, and it is frequently applied to the oil-rich Gulf states. One author finds that the rentier state theory is insufficient to explain political acquiescence. She asks, why does Qatar invest so much in nation-building if that were the case? She alludes to the fact that the state puts a lot of effort to create the Qatari identity with its own tradition and narrative. We know from other countries that nation-building is often done to dilute the question of class. If people consider themselves part of the same team, they are less likely to perceive inherent class contradictions. She also finds that people are indeed unhappy about the economic situation. But of course, under class society, a majority of the exploited classes being critical of the system does not mean that something's gonna change, since the minority is in power. The rentier state theory has also been criticized due to other countries showing the same patterns as the Gulf states without the rentier characteristic, which means there must be something else which more fundamentally explains these political realities. To do that, we need to zoom out of a particular nation as the unit of analysis and look at the global structure of capitalism and imperialism. On one side, we have dominant high-income imperialist powers. On the other, we have formally independent, economically dependent, weaker countries. When the dominant powers colonized the countries of Asia or Africa, they supported feudalism. The land-owning feudal classes were the basis to undermine the emerging national capitalist class of those countries, some of whom who were interested in independence through bourgeois nationalism, not least due to them wanting to have a larger share of wealth and privilege for themselves. In turn, the feudal class often received the colonialists with open arms to consolidate or increase their power such as the Zamindars of India with the East India Company or the pro-monarchists in Albania who collaborated with the English imperialists. Why did the advanced imperialists do this? Because the less independent a country is and the less a country's political system progresses, the better they can exploit the local toiling masses and a country's resources while keeping these places dependent on them. Let's think about the coup in Guatemala in 1954, where the CIA deposed President Jacobo Arbenz for aiming to do basic land reform to move the country from semi-feudalism to the capitalist stage, thus harming the profits of the United Fruit Company, today Chiquita Brands International Incorporated. Due to these dynamics, countries in these regions, including Qatar, do not develop capitalism organically, so to speak, but under the pressure of an imperialist collaborator class. Capitalism is established top-down, more artificially, so to speak. This is what Marxists call bureaucrat capitalism, aiming to combine elements of modern conditions for the functioning of international capital and elements from the backward state structure for maximum exploitation, not without contradictions between the two, however. As former leader of the communist movement in Turkey, Ibrahim Kaypakaya put it, quote, even if the ownership relations, primarily large land ownerships, are dissolved, the feudal relations continue with all their acuity, in particular in the superstructure. Bourgeois democracy goes always hand in hand with the lash of feudalism. All this, namely, any feudal relationships, facilitates the indirect domination of imperialism. They are its pillars. So, even though old relations of land ownership are largely replaced in Qatar, their superstructure, that is, the body of ideas and the structures that come with a backward mode of production, remain, for instance, the hereditary monarchy or the system of forced labor, which serve international capital by suppressing the local working class. Whereas capitalism could eliminate semi-feudal relations in the high-income Western European countries, 
semi-feudalism still remains in varying degrees in much of Asia or Africa. Akram Yari, founder and leader of the Progressive Youth Organization in Afghanistan during the 60s, wrote the following, quote, The growth and development of bureaucrat capitalism, which is mixed with oppression, disarrangements and feudal discriminations, and contaminated with corruptions, hierarchy of privileges, and at the same time fascist religious dictatorship, is also inseparably annexed to bureaucratic capitalism. So the thing which imperialist marketplace brings to such countries is a corrupt, half-tailed capitalism, which is rotten rather than progressive. Now, of course, there are many other factors that play a role here, such as the size, for instance. Small monarchic states are common, not just in the Middle East, see Monaco or Liechtenstein. Due to specific functions that they take in the broader economy, whether it be gas or banking, and the smaller size of the proletariat, it is generally speaking more difficult for a progressive national consciousness to develop. Let's remind ourselves that Qatari nationals are only a fraction of the population in Qatar. Many migrant workers see themselves as being on a temporary journey and not necessarily as being part of Qatari society. The rentier state theory also helps us to more fully grasp Qatar if put in relation to imperialism and class analysis. Holding back the domestic economic forces in favor of the gas export sector helps to consolidate the backward collaborator ruling class that is intertwined with the state structure while hampering the development of a more progressive national bourgeois stratum which would like to see capitalist relations and an according bourgeois democratic system fully develop in their state. The founder of the Communist Party of the Philippines, José María Sison, explained bureaucrat capitalism in the Philippines, but it might as well describe Qatar. Quote, they, families and cronies, personally benefit from the grant of concessions to exploiters of natural resources in the public domain, alienation of public land, franchises for the operation of public utilities, contracts in infrastructure building and related speculation in real estate, purchase contracts of the government, loans from state banks and insurance systems, endless perks and privileges through multiple positions and directorships in fund-rich government corporations. All of this does not mean that Qatar cannot itself be an expansionist, aggressive regional power, as it indeed is. Similar to Turkey, for instance, it can act on the geopolitical stage with quite some leeway. But it still has to subject itself to the imperialist system, such as acting as the gas station of greater powers or acting under the US military umbrella. Criticizing Qatar and not mentioning the international capitalist system that facilitates and benefits from their repressive state apparatus and the according class hierarchy is superficial at best. And don't forget that the imperative of endless capital accumulation and imperialist competition, which are destroying the environment and are causing the heavy reliance on fossil fuels, thus also adding to the massive power of the ruling class in the Gulf states in the first place. But this is only a process. Sooner or later, the working class in Qatar will, with the help of the international proletariat, liberate itself and score a hat-trick in defeating semi-feudalism, bureaucrat capitalism and the imperialist exploitation of the working class in their country.